Welcome to another Sustainable Packaging Summit virtual panel. Um, today we're talking about glass. Um, in my early days at Packaging Europe, um, a long, long time ago, I recall that the prevailing preoccupation in packaging um, around cost saving and sustainability was down gauging. And in that context, we saw glass gradually losing market share to plastics across several product categories. Um, but in today's context, if we fast forward, there's a lot of concern, obviously, about uh, where all of our plastic is ending up and a recognition that, that glass is one of the better performers in terms of the, the circular economy and the existing infrastructure for uh, collection and recycling. Um, then on the other hand, carbon footprint is increasingly central to our environmental thinking. Um, and that's quite a challenge for uh, the glass industry. So today we'll be exploring these challenges and it's the goals and the opportunities for the sector. And I'm delighted to be in, uh, joined by four experts who have different perspectives on container glass to help guide us through these topics today. So uh, welcome to, first of all, uh, Vanessa Chesno, who is head of public affairs and public po policy at product policy, sorry, at FEVE. Marius Kostak, who is General Manager at Green Glass Recycling. John Sadlier, who is Chief Sustainability and Procurement Officer at ARDA. And Neil Walker, Sustainability Manager uh, for External Partnerships and Integration and Global uh, Procurement at Diageo. Welcome, everyone. Um, maybe it would be great to start with a, a short uh, introduction to, to each of you. Um, Vanessa, first of all, could you uh, let us know um, just who you are and uh, what uh, FEVE does? Yeah, good afternoon, uh, everybody, and uh, thank you very much for the, uh, the invitation. So I'm Vanessa Cheno. I'm a head of uh, public affairs and product policy at FEVE. So FEVE is the European Container Glass uh, Federation. So we are based in, uh, in Brussels, and we represent more than 90% of the uh, European glass container uh, manufacturing industry in, in Europe. So our members produce uh, bottles, uh, jars, flacons for a number of sectors, so food and beverages, but also pharmaceuticals, cosmetics, uh, and uh, perfumery. Um, so they operate more than 140 plants uh, across, uh, across uh, the, the whole uh, Europe. And today, I think uh, one of the key uh, aspects that we'll be discussing is sustainability, which is really a key a uh, driver for uh, our members. Um, just to give you a, a first number, uh, our members spend more than 600 millions uh, per year to uh, upgrade their plans, to invest in decarbonization, in energy efficiency, uh, etc. So this is really uh, significant and sustainability is really a uh, top priority for, for our uh, members. So I'm really looking, for, looking forward to the discussion we'll be having uh, today. Thank you, thank you. Um, Marius, let's let's go to you next. Could you just introduce yourself? Thank you, thank you, Tim. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, thank you for the invitation. It's an honor to be here today with you. Um, I'm the general manager of uh, Green Glass. Green Glass is uh, based in Romania. Uh, main activity is recycling of uh, packaging glass, and is part of a group of companies with a focus on recycling called Green Group. Uh, our group, just to give you some numbers, our group will employ around 2,000 people. We have 10 uh, production facilities uh, in three countries, Romania, Slovakia, and Lithuania, and uh, with a turnover of approximately 170 million uh, euros. Um, our focus is on uh, recycling, uh, as I mentioned a little bit earlier, on PET, PET bottles, glass, electronics, cables, and uh, batteries. Coming back to green glass, uh, the plant has a capacity of 110,000 tons and is located uh, near Bucharest. And the last thing I would like to add, uh, green glass is a proud member of Fervor. Fervor is the association of uh, recycler of glass in, in, uh, in Europe and in a very close contact uh, with the Fervor. Thank you. Thank you very much, Marius. And let's turn to John next. Could you give us a short introduction? Thank you. I'm John Sadlier from the Arda Group. Uh, the Arda Group is a, uh, a manufacturer of glass container and uh, aluminium beverage cans for the food and beverage industry. Uh, we're approximately 9 billion in revenue and we have facilities in Europe, 
uh, all across Europe, uh, North America, Brazil, and the latest acquisition in Africa, where we acquired the consult group. So we have facilities now in South Africa, Nigeria, Ethiopia, and Kenya, which is a very exciting addition to the group. Um, my role in the company is as Chief Sustainability Officer. Arda is very, very committed to the sustainability agenda. It has been part of what we've done for a very long time, but we've really picked up the pace in the last number of years to drive this agenda forward from both our glass business and also our aluminium cam business. Um, it's a very exciting time in the company as we go through this change. And um, I'm very excited to be here today. I've been with the company for almost 15 years now. And um, I'd have to say a great company, very focused on um, making sure we're at the front of things rather than at the back end. And as a result, sustainability really is top of our agenda. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. And last but not least, let's hear from Neil Walker from Diageo. Hi, everyone. I'm Neil. Um, Diageo is a, is a big company that um, you may or may not have heard of, but you will know our brands. Um, you will know our brands in terms of Johnny Walker Whiskey, Smirnoff, Bailey's, Guinness, Tankery, Gordon's Gin, and, and many more around the world. Um, it's, thank you for inviting me to speak today. We have brands that are over 250 years old, and they are synonymous with glass. Uh, glass has helped some of our brands conquer the world. Um, but as we stand here today in 2022, and we look forward to our sustainability ambitions uh, um, and our spirit of progress towards 2030, and uh, 2050, we, we have some big problems we have to tackle. Uh, glass, is, um, uh, glass is a heavy emissions burden. Uh, and, and we have a real problem in terms of you know, how do we ensure the continued legacy of our brands going forward, but also take responsibilities for tackling some of the, the challenges that we have in society today. So look forward to discussing that over the next hour. Thank you. Thank you, Neil. And I should say that um, we would like to interact with you, the audience, um, as much as we have time for. Um, so please, when you're watching on LinkedIn, uh, feel free to, to share questions and we'll try to address as many as we can at the end. Um, so Neil just uh, talked about uh, the the carbon footprint as a, as a challenge. And um, in my introduction, I alluded to those twin kind of sustainability uh, totem poles of, of uh, carbon footprint and uh, packaging waste and, and circular economy. So I'd like to, to really address both of these in uh, the course of the discussion. And let's start with carbon. Um, so uh, Vanessa, maybe it would be great to start with you. Um, could you talk us through how you see the, the situation and the challenge for, for glass uh, compared to other packaging materials in terms of uh, the carbon footprint? Yeah, sure. So it's true that glass needs uh, more energy to be produced uh, and, and requires more material per liter than other materials uh, to pack a product, hence the higher uh, carbon footprint. But this CO2 footprint is, um, is measured using uh, life cycle uh, analysis methodologies. I think what is important to have in mind is that these LCAs are based on scenarios, on assumptions. So by varying uh, the assumptions, you can get very different uh, results. So basically one kilo of glass is not another kilo of glass uh, in terms of CO2 footprint. If you take into account uh, recycled content, whether the bottle is reusable or not, uh, the type of energy uh, that it used to produce it, uh, how it's transported, uh, the distances, uh, etc. So I think that's an important uh, point to, to make, but also uh, what we believe is that, of course, CO2 uh, emissions are important. I think we'll have the uh, opportunity to explain a little bit uh, the decarbonization pathway of our members because they are committed to cli uh, climate neutrality by 2050. Uh, but CO2 is one aspect of many other uh, environmental uh, footprints. So we believe that it's also uh, important to have in mind other environmental or health um, aspects when uh, discussing the sustainability of a particular uh, packaging uh, material. So that includes uh, the benefits of closed loop recycling, infinite recyclability, 
uh, toxicity, the impact of, uh, of materials on biodiversity, littering, uh, etc. So these are all very important aspects that we should not forget when discussing uh, sustainability. Uh, and also when it comes to food and, and beverages in particular, uh, LCA doesn't take into account qualitative uh, aspects such as preservation of the product, uh, extending, extending uh, shelf life, uh, for which really uh, glass is a clear uh, leader to preserve uh, human health and, uh, and well-being. So, of course, CO2 emissions are important, but let's uh, make sure that we always have in mind this uh, holistic approach and all, all the other uh, aspects that can uh, come into play when, uh, when assessing uh, sustainability. Thank you. And I'd like to, to ask um, both John and, and Neil about this uh, carbon footprint question. Um, is there anything that you'd like to build on, first of all, in terms of that general picture? And then um, where do you see the, the opportunities to, uh, to re reduce? Where, where are the, the pathways that uh, Vanessa began to uh, allude to? Uh, John, let's go with you first. Sure. Thanks, Tim. I mean, I guess one of the <clears throat> really wonderful things about glass production is it really is all in our own house. You know, we do start either with colour, which is recycled glass, or we start with the basic raw material, sand, limestone, soda, etc. So the control over this decarbonization compared to other packaging substrates where a lot of the CO2 is embedded in the inbound material. In the case of glass, a lot of that is very much inside our own house as we transform these basic raw material into the wonderful product that is glass. So there are levers we can pull. Notwithstanding that, they are difficult levers. And they're levers that we need to work on quite a bit to get that cost balance and the sustainability balance right. But broadly speaking, Tim, the key levers are the, the transition to a, a different type of furnace. Last year, we applied for an EU grant. Uh, we're not successful, but nonetheless, um, the, we're still looking at this. And that's more on that hybrid furnace concept, which instead of using the standard 80% natural gas, 20% electricity. We look to invert this to more of a 20% natural gas, 80% electricity. We can also then, by increasing the colored content, we reduce the amount of energy used. We can look at transitioning to renewable electricity, which we within our are working on, and it's one of our stated goals in order to achieve SBTI. And then the emergence of hydrogen and the hydrogen economy to replace natural gas. That's quite a big one for us. Um, we do believe it will play a part together with this hybrid concept of greater electricity and less natural gas. But within that, then the portion of natural gas, we would look over time to convert into and, and, and use hydrogen as hydrogen becomes the fuel, uh, the, the low carbon fuel, particularly in Europe. So like I said to you, Tim, <clears throat> The good news is a lot of it is within the four walls of our own facilities, and that's great. Um, there are huge challenges in achieving all of this, but you know we do see routes that we can use in order to tackle the CO2 within glass, and we're quite optimistic for the future in that regard in our data. Thank you, thank you. So, Neil, um, I'm, I'm very interested in your perspective because obviously Diageo is inevitably uh, a big, heavy user of, of glass, but also, you know, uh, agnostic. You're going to use whatever is going to be, um, have the best business case and the best sustainability uh, credentials. Um, and uh, you have the opportunity of using other materials across your, your product line, um, including funky things like uh, paper um, coming into uh, uh, in, into at least niche applications. So, uh, yeah, how do you see this this carbon picture and, and how it fits into Diageo's uh, sustainability policies commitments? I'm really proud of the sustainability commitments we made, particularly the one around emissions reductions on an absolute basis by 50% uh, by 2030. That's, that, that, that's a phenomenal goal, a, a real noble cause for us to hit. And there's there's lots of factors at play here that are, are really challenging us right now. So, um, but what I would also like to reflect is that things are starting to move. 
Um, you know, Diageo um, do have a lot of their glass supplied by John's organisation, and uh, and we're working really closely with with Arda um, on a number of fronts, um, including process innovation that John's talked about, and uh, you know, um, clean energy. So we're um, it's it's a real challenge for us. I think you know personally, I joined Diageo because I wanted to help. Um, be a custodian of our brands for the next 200 years. And uh, and these send us a lot of challenges. The way that we look at the challenges around different packaging materials is rather than say, let's hop around from one to another, um, as, as we ask every packaging category to take responsibility for the challenges that it has. And then we work with people that will help us tackle those challenges. Um, I don't see there being a big space, uh, you know, supply chains are finely balanced, probably not incredibly well balanced just now in the world. So for us to say oh, glass is bad and, or plastic is bad or whatever, I don't think that's that's useful for us at all long term. Uh, so I think that we look at things on, on a number of factors. Um, we need innovation, process innovation. We need to collaborate. Uh, we need to ask a lot of our suppliers. Um, we need to create space for innovation and in organizations like Glass Futures have been really important to us on, on that basis. We also need to educate people because actually in glass, in terms of emissions, recycling is a minor lever we can pull. We don't get those eco-efficiency gains in recycling that, that you do in, in other materials like aluminium. And uh, we've really had to educate our stakeholders internally on that. Um, and that's opened up a real commitment across our business for our brands and our board in terms of looking at other other ways of bringing product to market um, and really looking into the fundamentals of what is the circular economy. So in the circular economy, we have a technical cycle for service products, packaging fits in there. And the smaller the, the, smaller the loop, the better. So maintaining and reuse, you know, will give us, as Vanessa said, bigger gains than in uh, than in recycling. Um, I'm saying all are essential, and all contribute to us achieving our goals. So where we are in 2022, looking out for the next eight years, I think we're trying to put um, we're trying to pull all the levers to see what engagement we get, not just in the system that we're in, but also in terms of you know, um, with our clients and with our customers as we design the products and services that we put on the market for the future. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes, and it's an interesting point that you made that, you know, I've set up this dichotomy of uh, carbon on one hand and, and uh, circular economy on the other, but um, they're very linked and it's, it's very important that we, we think about the most low carbon uh, routes towards a uh, circular economy when, uh, when we... Um, holistically um, design our strategies and systems etc um, you, you've alluded to to um, reuse and, and and this uh aspect of the uh the different kinds of supply chains that we have um i'm interested in, in, in how all of your the panelists uh think about the importance of the outside of the production uh, of glass where obviously uh, the initial uh, inputs of, of energy are very high. Um, where are the um, challenges uh, and the opportunities in terms of the the supply chain itself, in in terms of reducing uh, carbon footprints of, of uh, glass packaging? Vanessa, would you like to to go first? Yeah, I was about. I wanted to unmute. Sorry. Uh, <laughs> yes. Yeah, so, in terms of reuse, uh, reuse is very important for the glass industry because basically our members, uh, we are happy. Well, very happy that our members can provide both one-way packaging that is recyclable and uh, reusable packaging that is not only reusable actually, but also uh, recyclable at the end of. Uh, of uh, its lifetime. So clearly, uh, glass is a leader in terms of uh, of, uh, of reuse. We estimate that uh, more than 20% of uh, beers, uh, soft drinks, and uh, mineral water uh, that are put on the EU market are uh, packed in uh, reusable glass. So that's quite uh, considerable. Uh, 
Uh, and uh, we see examples of uh, reuse systems in, uh, in Germany, in the Netherlands, or, or in Belgium, for example. And they have existed for uh, uh, quite a while on a voluntary uh, basis. So um, reuse can definitely be uh, a solution, but so is one-way packaging, depending on uh, the, the local condition, because uh, basically reuse works best in short uh, supply chain, if there is uh, uh, support from uh, consumers and also the, the, the proper, the adequate uh, infrastructure in place to make sure that packaging is actually uh, being reused and, and rotate uh, as many times as, uh, as possible. So depending on the, on, the, on the context, on the market, on the product as well, uh, one way or reusable packaging can, uh, can be a, a, a solution. Um, what we see is that at the moment there is a lot of uh, policy attention uh, to, to reuse uh, and what we try to convey as a message is that it really represents a systemic uh, change of, uh, of business models and supply chain and so it's extremely uh, complex um, and it's totally different to uh, the, the, the the supply chain for for one way uh, packaging. So we are really keen to uh, engage with uh, with stakeholders, with with policymakers, uh, to discuss what it takes uh, to uh, engage in that systemic change, uh, and looking at uh, the infrastructure that, that is needed uh, in terms of reverse logistics, the involvement of new uh, stakeholders such as cleaning uh, facilities. Uh, how can we engage with the with the consumers to ensure that uh, it's still convenient for them uh, to, to 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 buy and to uh, return back their their packaging, et cetera, et cetera. So it's uh, it's extremely uh, complex, and we are really keen to uh, to engage on that uh, on that topic with uh, with the value chain. Thank you. So on on the topic of that we've just been speaking about of. of uh, Carbon, is there anything else that anyone would like to contribute before we, we move on? Anything we've missed out here? Marius. Uh, yeah, thank you. Thank you, Tim. Um, I wanted to add also one thing because it's clear that in the production of glass, there is a, a high consumption of energy. But on the other hand, uh, the producers of, of glass, they are doing uh, a very good thing uh, by adding the collet into their uh, uh, glass collet into the new product because this is saving quite a lot of energy. For example, for every 10% of collet used in uh, production of new bottles, it saves around two, between two and three percent of the uh, uh, energy. And there is another important thing: by using collet, there is a lot of uh, CO2 CO2 uh, saving. Around for one ton of collet use, uh, it, there are around 300 kilos of uh, CO2 reduction. And if you ask me, because there was the discussion in between uh, uh, why glass is good, and I really, I really enjoyed the, the title of this uh, webinar, uh, harnessing the infinity. Uh, the glass is infinity, and in my opinion, um, as a recycler, and from this perspective, I believe that the producer of glass should advertise more the good things that they are doing better uh, in comparison with other types of material because nowadays everybody talks about how much content of uh, recycled plastic is in the new bottles but nobody really talks uh, how much uh, recycled glass is in uh, new glass and from my perspective because at the end of the day uh, we are talking with the consumer in a way or another your products are reaching to the in the hands of the of the consumer and i think that the the glass lost a little bit uh, here from uh, from uh, this i could call it marketing uh, marketing uh, trend thank you marius thank you um and, and one final question we obviously we've talked about um alternative energy uh sources um obviously that could be a game changer when when the the key input into glass is uh, the the energy uh, footprint. What kind of timetable do we see? What how how quickly can uh, is it viable to to switch across to uh, renewable energy sources or even hydrogen? John, do you have a a, a sense of sure <clears throat> um, within our uh, stated sustainability strategy? 
which um, we which underpins our application for the science-based targets. We set a target to be at 100% renewable electricity by 2030. I would say <clears throat> even by 2030 to get our entire network to renewable will be a challenge. Okay, um, doing the various PPAs, virtual PPAs. We're doing some on-site, also some near-site renewable projects. They're very tedious, very challenging. In some cases, the grid, let's say, is very welcoming of this. In other cases, the grid, the, the, the local grids are not as welcoming of it. So it's quite the challenge to get through each of these, and it's, it's not quick. But nonetheless, we still feel that 2030, we can have our uh, entire electrical portfolio as a, um, a renewable portfolio. If you go over then to hydrogen, I think that's still at its infancy. I think energy security now, particularly in the EU, is become, going to become so important. And what we're also seeing is the cost of renewables have come to the point now where it's starting to be almost economical um, uh, to produce hydrogen. Um, but I think it's a huge, huge, huge and a very long road before hydrogen becomes a, a major part of our fuel mix in Europe. I think 2030 might be ambitious, 2040 might happen. But in this context, I think a lot of it depends on what the local governments, the member states, the EU, the UK, and what support uh, the governments give to put in the right infrastructure. Um, having electrolyzers at each facility long-term is not the answer. We need to have pipe networks around um, Europe harnessing renewable energy. Um, so I think it's a very exciting future, but I think that transition to the hydrogen economy will take a bit of time, Tim. Mm, indeed. And um, it's one of the, the many factors that we that we encounter when we're talking about packaging sustainability, where um, it's not in our hands as a, a packaging or FMCG industry, as it requires um, the harnessing of, of a lot more uh, societal and, and regulatory forces, etc. Thank you. Well, let, let's move on to talking more um, directly about the, the circular economy. Um, and maybe we could start by by benchmarking. Again, we'll, we'll turn to, to uh, Vanessa. Um, what's the, the current uh, recycling rate uh, across Europe for, for container glass? And, and where do you want to get to as an industry? Yeah, thank you very much. So I will build on what uh, Marius uh, said previously that um, so maybe to, to recontextualize a little bit in terms of CO2 emissions, 80% uh, of CO2 emissions from our members come from the energy that is used. So that's what uh, John talked about. And the remaining 20% come from uh, virgin raw uh, material. So there is a clear interest from our members, both in terms of decarbonization and uh, circular economy to increase uh, the level of recycled content in, uh, in, their, in their products. So that's clearly a key priority uh, for our members. And for us, collection is, uh, is key because uh, increasing the level of recycled content requires collecting uh, more glass in terms of uh, quantities, but also in terms of, of quality. Um, so at the moment, in terms of collection, we are at 78% uh, collection for recycling uh, rate. So that means that almost 8 out of uh, 10 bottles put on the EU market are collected to be uh, recycled. So that's already a very good uh, performance. Uh, but we want to go higher and we want to go higher with, uh, with partners. So we initiated uh, Close the Glass Loop, uh, which mm -hmm. is a multi-stakeholder uh, partnership that brings together brands uh, including in the in the spirit sector so Diageo is uh, is participating um, uh, also the recyclers so fervor is a is a partner but we also have municipalities we have extended producer responsibility schemes etc so we we try to bring together the whole uh, glass packaging value chain with the ambition of achieving a 90 percent collection for recycling uh, rate up to the um, to the current uh, 78. Uh, person, so that's really a key, uh, a key, a key project uh, for for us uh, to uh, work both on the circular economy, uh, but also on uh, on the decarbonization of uh, of glass packaging. 
Thank you. And so, so building on that picture, how do we get that that next twelve percent uh, increase in uh, collection and, and recycling? Um, I'm interested in the panel's views of um, what are the pathways and the actions that we need to see taken to to make that happen. Um, Marius, could could you maybe start off on that? Uh, thank you. Yeah, um, it's quite clear that um, as as Vanessa was mentioning. Uh, we are there, 78% uh, for uh, for a material which which is not so easy to be transported uh, and collected and transported. It's a, it's it's a huge increase. And uh, just a few years ago, I believe the percentage was only 70 uh, 70%. So now we are 78, and for sure uh, it it will be very close to to, to 90%, or it will reach 90% very very soon. How it can be done? Uh, Besides the, the working together with the consumer municipalities and so on, I think also the area system can help, and it helped quite a lot in the, in a lot of countries. And the beauty with the with the with the uh, DRS system in comparison with the EPR, because it uh, is the level of target of uh, of collection. Currently, according with the European directive, the uh, collection of uh, the target for collection of glass and recycled clothes is sixty five percent. When it comes to the DRS, the, the percentage of uh, and the targets imposed to the producer through the DRS system are much higher, close to 90%. Yeah. So from this perspective, the DRS system can uh, can uh, can help uh, quite uh, quite a lot. Uh, okay, there is also here a long discussion on this topic. Yeah, because uh, it depends quite a lot when the DRS system comes on uh, on. Uh, on what material the filler should go between glass, plastic, and, uh, and aluminium, but I wouldn't uh, enter into many details uh, in, uh, in uh, today because anyhow we have a short uh, short time, and it's a long discussion. But it's clear that this uh, can help a lot from uh, from a lot of perspective. Other 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 system, I told you, they're already in place. Yeah, so we need something additional to this, and the DRS system is not yet all over Europe, but according with our estimation, I think in by 2030, I think all Europe, it will be covered by the ERS system. Okay. There's a, a criticism or a concern that sometimes puts toward deposit return uh, schemes um, in that they are diverting quite a valuable recycled material away from the, the, the mainstream curbside uh, collection. Um, and that they could have detrimental effects on on the the broader um, circular economy and the uh, economic viability of recycling. Um, is this something that you think is has uh, validity as as a as a concern? Uh, from my perspective, not really, because you know the system of collection. We are in this business. Our company, our group of companies, uh, we have already twenty years since we are on the market. And uh, being in Romania, Central Eastern Europe, uh, recently, I told you we are in Slovakia and Lithuania, uh, mm, uh, it's a little bit different than the Western Europe in when it comes to, to, to collection, recycling. Not too much different, but uh, uh, it were, there were some differences, especially before joining the, the EU. And what we notice is the following thing. is like the vessel, the communicated vessel. Yeah? Yeah? So if it will drop the curve side, it will go into an increase in this way. And the people which are doing this, yeah, they will, they will do something else. And imagine about one thing that when you put a label on a bottle, a can or a plastic uh, glass bottle or a plastic bottle, that that bottle has a value of 10 cents, euro cents, 15 euro cents. When they brought that material to a collection center, maybe they got only three cents or whatever. So practically, uh, those those uh, those uh, people they will and uh, they will be the best collector even ever, and they will even be more motivated in in, in going to in this uh, this activity. So uh, it's it's difficult to say which is the best. Yeah. But at the end of the day, we are talking nowadays a lot of uh, sustainability, circular economy. But the circular economy. I think Ardach, yeah, they were doing it uh, since they first produced uh, the first bottle. Because after they produced the first bottle, <laughs> the second bottle was produced maybe with 10% color. 
Yeah, the third bottle was produced with 20% carrot, and so on and so forth. Yeah, circular economy it happens for many, 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 many years now. The issue is not the issue. The good thing is, and I will call it the perfect storm, is that all the stakeholders currently are aligned. Yeah, 20 years ago it was only the NGOs, Greenpeace, whatever. Yeah, they were talking about the environmental issues and so on. Then. Uh, it came after that. It came the, the the consumer, especially the younger generation, which were more aware about the environmental issues. The producer learned about this, saw it, and they they see also the benefits in between marketing and also cost. Mm -hmm. And currently, they will say that this is like a perfect storm or perfect alignment of the of all the interests of all the stakeholders. And that's why nowadays we are talking so much about circular economy, sustainability net zero 2030 and this brought to set up targets and when you set up a target everybody got interest in this you know because of different reasons some people they would like to be, i would be the first one to use this i would reach the first one to be net zero and so on but looking at the the, the full picture this is what i can say is that this is very 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 good from all points of view Mm -hmm. from the consumer, environment, producer, everybody is aligned uh, in my point of view. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And I'm just curious, does, does everyone have, is there consensus on this panel about the, the benefits of DRS uh, compared to other systems? Do you, does anyone have any disagreement or qualification to, to what Marius said? Um, or do you see that as the, uh, as a, a general good, if it can be extended across uh, uh, all countries and geographies. I, I wonder if. Oh, sorry, Neil. Go ahead. Neil. No, you know more about this topic than me. On you go. Go ahead if you. Well, uh, well, I am afraid I will have to disagree uh, with Marius on on that specific uh, point. So. I mentioned the seventy-eight uh, percent collection for recycling rate, uh, which hides differences uh, from one country to, to another, with some countries below uh, this average. And so our objective is clearly to, um, to make sure that everybody moves uh, to the 90% collection for recycling uh, mm -hmm. target. And so that's why within Close the Glass Group, for example, we have national action plans to make sure that whatever is uh, done at national level is tailored to the local uh, specificities, uh, etc. That being said, for us, uh, what is very the key objective for us is to achieve this 90% collection for recycling rate. And so we've looked at whether introducing uh, DRS, so a new system that would come on top of uh, the current uh, bottle bank uh, or cupside collection systems would help achieve uh, that target. And, and the results, looking at the six uh, DRS which are operating with glass and scope at the moment is that it's not it's not the case, and that could be actually uh, counterproductive. Uh, so what, what we believe is that we, we see that uh, glass has been collected very successfully uh, in the past decade via bottle banks, via curbside collection, because they collect all types of glass packaging. The problem with the RS is that they concentrate on a minor fraction of packaging. So uh, usually it's beer, water, soft drinks, sometimes uh, spirits and wines. Uh, but that means that you still need another system to collect uh, food jars, to collect uh, cosmetics, etc. So that's very confusing uh, to consumers. And also we don't need it because uh, other materials uh, will need a separate waste stream for food contact packaging. We don't need that. We can collect everything. Uh, Marcus will uh, sort and treat uh, the waste and then it it's back to our members' uh, furnaces, to, to John's uh, furnaces. So we believe it's much more uh, simple and convenient for everybody to collect glass in one single uh, place instead of having uh, another system. And also when looking at uh, performance, we see that um, EPR systems can achieve performances above 90%. Which GRS can do, but again, it's not honestly uh, convenient. And in some countries, what we have seen is that um, the collection rate in the DRS can be high indeed, uh, but then there is a very negative impact on uh, the, the EPR stream because that can result in disinvestment, uh, that can confuse consumers. 
So why the collection rate in the DRS can increase overall, the, the collection rate may actually uh, decrease. And again, mm -hmm. our objective is to ensure that we have this 90% for all packaging, glass packaging, and not only for uh, beer packaging or, or, or soft drinks. Mm -hmm. um, so our view is that instead of introducing a system that is uh, not convenient, uh, that is also uh, quite costly, it's better to invest and to uh, improve what we have at the moment, which has a proven track record, even though, again, there is definitely room for improvement in a number of, uh, of countries. And that's why Close the Glass Loop is so, uh, is so critical for, for us. Mm. I'd make an observation that it, it, consumer behavior and sort of the heritage of the systems that we have in different, in different geographies can mean that you know one system works really well drs you know in for example germany where it's uh, it's been a, a around for a very long time um uh could be extremely effective um and then less effective in another country where consumers haven't been um uh, educated over over decades to to behave in a certain way so um i guess maybe there isn't a one size fits all uh route map uh for for uh maximizing collection and retrieval uh, rates yeah i think well, that yeah. uh vanessa sorry no go ahead sorry don't want to monopolize so vanessa's taught me a lot about about the different uh, styles and cultures all all around the world so you know in diageo headquartered in the uk we can think about the uk a lot um but you know if you look out in sweden um, what they do in terms of EPR is really great. So you would say, well, why would you introduce something different when you already have a really high recycling rate? Um, I think there's a couple. Of, there's a couple of observations. The first thing is recycling is recycling. Recycling isn't a circular economy. A circular economy is a system that's regenerative by design. You know, with a technical and biological cycle. So if there's one thing that that I would ask all of our listeners or viewers today is, is for us to really deeply understand what the circular economy is and there's some great stuff out there about that um, so the second thing to say is is that there's some really great work done by like dr walter stahill at the product life institute in geneva so he looks at he looked at a beer can or a glass bottle and said you know these are theoretically infinite materials but at a 70 percent recycle rate and a uh, you know, and they're only being really about three or four weeks between one of these cans being filled with a soft drink or a beer. Um, this infinitely recyclable material is going to be in landfill um, within 12 months, right? So I think that we really have to understand the system that we're in and the problems that we're creating. So in terms of infinite recyclability, that is great so long as the, rec so long as the recycling system is incredibly well designed. My last thought on this and we did quite a lot of consumer research a um, couple of years back, just before the pandemic, in terms of what do our consumers think about reuse, about recycling, about maybe having multiple waste streams for EPR and DRS, is that they are not um, consumers are not as wedded to this subject or as informed in this subject as everyone who's probably listening today. Um, some care, a lot of people don't. Um, so simplicity is key, consistency is key, and motivation is key. And that's what, that's where, in terms of deposit return schemes, having a value on a single use material that will become waste is important in some scenarios. Um, I would personally like to see um, pilots and experimentation on DRS that build on top of what's already there rather than sit it side to side and, and confusing people. Thank you. Thank you. And so is reuse part of the um, close the glass loop kind of roadmap? Is that something that you see as a key uh, enabler of, of uh, circularity? And uh, uh, Vanessa? So in terms of the objectives, Close the Glass Up is really about uh, collection and, uh, okay. and recycling. So boosting the collection rate and also improving uh, the, the quality. That's also the, the second uh, pillar. Reuse is not part of uh, the objectives or the mandates of Close the Glass Loop as such. 
but when we talk about glass packaging, we can't uh, ignore uh, reusable packaging, of course. And for example, what we're trying to do in Close the Glass Loop is to share best practices. So really address bottlenecks in terms of collection, uh, recycling, sorting, etc. Uh, so, for example, uh, collection in, in big cities or collection in touristic areas, or for example, in uh, hotels, restaurants, and, and cafes, because a lot of glass uh, packaging is consumed and uh, and, and discarded uh, in uh, in Horeca uh, in the Horeca channel. Uh, but that's we, we, we believe that there is potential to do uh, much better in terms of collection in this uh, on, on trade uh, channel. So that's definitely a priority. And when you consider the Horeca channel, you always have to look at yeah one-way packaging, but also reusable packaging, which can be quite a significant share of what is being uh, consumed. Uh, in hotels, bar, uh, cafes, restaurants, uh, etc. So that way, we we do not address reuse as such in close the glass loop, but uh, indirectly, we always have to tr to to take into account the reuse uh, dynamics, because that will have an impact potentially on the potential for uh, the, the 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 collection rate. Um, so that's uh, definitely something we 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 keep in mind. Um, and maybe to, to react to something that was said before on consumers, uh, that's uh, really an important uh, point uh, that we probably need to be more vocal about uh, the benefits of, of glass uh, in terms of recyclability, reusability, inertness, uh, etc. Um, and, and that's why as an industry, our members are really uh, uh, committed and have driven a number of, uh, of, of projects. Uh, so, for example, we have a campaign that's called uh, Friends of Glass that communicates about the, uh, the benefits of, of glass, but also on the importance of uh, recycling. Because maybe we take it as a, great, as a, as a given that uh, recycling has positive benefits, but maybe it's not known or it's forgotten by consumers. So we need to, to remind them. Uh, and that's also why we have launched a hallmark, the glass hallmark, uh, which is basically a logo uh, to be placed on bottles uh, directly to remind consumers of the recyclability of glass, of its uh, inertness, and uh, really convey the message that uh, glass packaging is not waste, it's really a resource. And so it's very important that they do the right thing when they uh, dispose of their uh, empty packaging so that it can stay in the economy for as long as, uh, as possible because that makes uh, environmental uh, and, and, and economic sense for, for everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we've had some really interesting uh, questions coming through from our audience. So I'm going to try not to spend too much longer with our initial agenda, but I would like to, to ask John um, about innovation. You, you've talked to us about the the work that's been done on um, reducing energy inputs and um, the uh, aspirations for um, low carbon energy. Um, what about um, innovation in, in bottle design, design for sustainability itself? And I know that over the years, a lot of work has already been done on um, lightweighting bottles and um, it's kind of suggested that it, it's almost a perfect form now it's hard to to take much more weight out of it but I'm interested in your views there and any other areas of innovation around uh, bottle design uh, or um, etc that, that you think uh, are important to sustainability I think in the first instance you did hit the nail on the head Tim glass is a 3,000 year old material so revolution in the design of glass is probably unlikely at this stage. Um, it's a continuous evolutionary process. We're always looking at where can we take weight out of a bottle? How can we design it better with our customer? How can we um, reduce the, uh, the overall impact or the CO2 impact of the bottle? Um, but once again, I would say it's more evolution rather than revolution. Uh, one project we are working on, and we announced it last year during uh, COP26, was the uh, project, the joint project with uh, Diageo, uh, Dassault Systems, and, and, and a startup company called Exergy on a coating for a bottle. We're still working through that. It is, it is, it is. It's going to take uh, some more time, but some 
interesting results at the start. Um, and that's around coating a bottle with an ultimate goal of potentially being able to do some lightweighting. But like I say, with a 3,000 year old material, revolution is certainly something that's uh, hard to come by. Okay, thank you. There was a, a, an initiative that uh, really caught my eye a couple of years ago. And in fact, it was one of the winners of the sustainability awards, which we organize um, uh, that at our, uh, 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 brought uh, to our attention. So this was um, taking the the small particle broken particles yes. of, of uh, uh, glass in the recycling process and creating briquettes to uh, that could then be fed back into the uh, glass making process. Um, is could you give us an update on on how that is uh, uh, progressing? So we won the award. We were delighted with that. It was something that we'd been working on for a while and we're very serious about progressing it. What we found was that some of the pressures being used in that briquette manufacturing were quite extreme. So we rethought about how we did it to reduce the pressures. Uh, we've come up with a, a different approach, which is the same, but a little bit different. And we're looking at going, uh, investing in a, in a larger scale plant at uh, some time in the near future. So uh, that's about, uh, so I would say we're still working on it. We had to tweak the design a little bit, but it's fundamentally the same thing, Tim. And uh, we are continuing to work it. And I do believe we will be successful and it will be mass produced within a um, within the medium term. Okay, great. That's really exciting to hear. And I was very excited about that as a project mm -hmm. because uh, we've talked about the, the shortfall in in collection um there's also um you know a, a sizable percentage of of the collected glass which uh, is lost within the recycling process and uh, being able to eliminate that would be a, a great great step forward wouldn't it well, i think um, you're right we've been working on that for really quite some time and uh, I, I do believe at this stage we've got the balance in the design great great um good well i'm i'm gonna put the open the floor to our our um audience now and I'm going to take a look at the questions that are coming through on LinkedIn. So um, let's go with this one. Um, we've talked about reuse obviously in our discussion um, and the question asks is with reuse being a clear opportunity for glass is there any collaborative work to standardize packaging um, in order to promote reuse at scale? Um, any thoughts on the idea of, of uh, standardizing containers for, for reuse? Yeah, um, I think from a mathematical perspective, that completely makes sense. Um, and I think that um, where we are on the journey of reuse, uh, Vanessa talked about it in terms of the odd trade hotels, bars, et cetera, very experimental and, and very early. Packaging um, protects and promotes brands. And like, for example, with Johnny Walker, the square bottle is, you know, has, has, has been part of its brand for, for, for a couple of hundred years. Um, and beer, um, you know, um, beer bottles quite standard. And, and we can see that a lot. We had the uh, reuse in place in Ireland. Um, and, and from studying the German market as well, you can see the, um, the you know, uh, a standard bottle is, is, is a great way of making that work. What I would come back to say in terms of brands changing, they've previously just thought about their brand, um, the continuing the legacy of the brand, continuing the traditions of the brand, the premiumization that take us to things like, you know, uh, crystal glass, etc. That, that is, we're in the process of changing that right now. So I think what I think that in terms of brands and markets, I think that there's an increasing amount of open mindedness ab about the concept of reuse, about the concept of glass color, about the concept of um, you, you know create, creating new systems. So, um, and we haven't done anything to date in terms of our premium spirits brands. It would be a big ask. Um, but if we could create something that that was um, that really had it was a power play in terms of hitting our 2030 ambitions then i think that we would try to find a way to make that work thank you very much 
Okay, so we've had a question about um, the the global picture in terms of glass recycling. Um, I don't know if anyone is able to talk about, um, for example, in uh, Africa, uh, what's the what's the situation there? Um, the the question I mentioned that John uh, had uh, said that Ada is expanding into Africa. What's the what's the global circular economy in glass looking like? It's a, uh, it certainly is uh, different in the different uh, economies. I would say Europe is probably the most advanced and Northern Europe, maybe in some respects, uh, the most advanced again. Um, once you get to a place like Africa, uh, where you've, um, uh, you don't have the formal bottle, you have some bottle banks, etc., like you're used to seeing in Europe, but a lot of it is, um, is collection uh, by uh, people on lower lower incomes who will trawl through landfill or uh, waste etc in order to to collect the glass so it does provide a degree of employment in that regard um, and the business down there has done an amazing job in actually building up a supply of colour from the numerous methodologies of collecting in collecting it individually, manually, through the number of bottle bins, etc. Through um, There's a lot of reuse glass in Africa, so that brewery uh, material or the distillery material coming through. So they've done an incredible job at building up the recycled content, actually, and hats off to them. And um, I think it's something they will continue to do. Once you get to other African countries, the methodology is similar. The level of advancement compared to South Africa isn't there. Uh, we see a similar scenario in Brazil. The companies at it a while have done a good job in that collection. North America, 80% of your glass comes from the states which have deposits and some of the other states where your landfill, let's say, would be particularly cheap. Um, the collection rates are nowhere as near as good. So it's an incredible mix, Tim. Um, it is something that, yeah, when you wake up in the middle of the night and you're starting to think about it, you just think about how could we all do it the same way and achieve a 90% global um, collection rate. Wouldn't that be fantastic? Because, you know, we just can't, we have to tread lighter on the planet. We cannot keep consuming, consuming more primary material. And so recycling is such a, an important part as populations grow. Okay. So it is different. Um, and we're doing our piece where we can, where we, where we're involved to try and encourage greater recycling, because we do, you know, it has benefits in manufacture, it has benefits for society, it has benefits for the material, you know, there's just benefits everywhere. Thank you if I much. may, yeah, uh, yeah, I would like to take the opportunity for those of you who are interested in this global perspective to uh, invite you to uh, the annual uh, online conference of Close the Glass Loop that will take place on the 30th of June and basically will take the opportunity of the UN uh, International Year of Glass uh, to look at what's going on uh, elsewhere uh, in the world. So we'll have a representative from uh, people, people from Kosovo, from Guatemala and uh, from Kenya to hear about their specific challenges and what they are doing to really uh, try to yeah, boost the circular economy of glass in these uh, in these uh, countries where yeah Europe is clearly a, a leader and uh, a lot needs to be done uh, as well in other regions. So we want to uh, bring well, shed light on what's going on elsewhere as well. So close the glass loop 30th of June early afternoon. Uh, join us and uh, you can ask question and 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 join us. Thank you for that, um, Vanessa and. Are details of that available on your website, the FEVE website? Uh, yeah, or Close the Glass Loop, uh, LinkedIn, Close the Glass Loop. Close the glass okay. loop as well. Yeah. Great. Thank you. We've got a couple of questions that are really interesting. We've more or less run out of time, but if uh, if you will indulge me, we'll try to um, ask these and, and just very quickly address them. So first of all, um, how will or can blockchain technology uh, be used to increase glass recycling rates. Any any thoughts on the opportunity to to apply blockchain here? Uh, I will try. I will try to answer. It's not an easy. Okay. Uh, uh, what we see as a recycler and collector is that 
and we see it uh, also as consumer that the technology has a role uh, which is increasingly not year by year by day by day in our life yeah so in blockchain yeah i i know a few companies which are startup which already show me some pilot uh, project that they started uh, in order to uh, help companies that are doing the collection and recycling uh, to use blockchain and not only companies only the collector the full system in such a way that the material to be collected i wouldn't enter in detail but i can tell you one thing is happening already okay at a very small scale uh is still in the startup phase at least with the company that i talk with but i believe that we'll see more and more in in into this yeah and uh, i in my view as we are counting on, on technology i believe that this will be this will uh, this is will, will happen for, for for sure so we'll see this kind of involvement this kind of uh, technology into in also into the collection and recycling of, of glass for sure Thank you. Uh, if, if I may add something to the previous question, and um, I think it's, uh, it's uh, I believe that it's very important because we are talking about consumer uh, almost uh, from time to time during our conversation. I will tell you, but we also pronounce the word waste. Uh, we have two British natives here, so they can give us the definition of uh, waste from Oxford. Yeah, in my view, uh, and not in my view. I think we should think to rethink the word waste and to replace this word with resources. Because we were talking a little bit earlier how to motivate the consumer to do this. If you tell to them this is waste, sorry, I wanted to take a glass of water to show it to you. I don't have a bottle with me here. Yeah, this is waste. Then the first thing is that okay, I will throw it away. But if we tell them and if we will teach them this is resource i believe that the mindset the full mindset it will be totally totally change yeah and this is one thought that i give that uh, it can be uh, really used in our in our group we are using this uh, this motto for a very long long time yeah we we are not talking about waste we are talking about resources yeah but we should step out of of our uh, let's say people which are involved in this domain, because all of us, when you're talking about circular economy, we know that waste is equal to resources and we have to move it further to the consumer. And how to do it, the most easiest way is with the product that they get. Yeah, And I think this is, a, this is something that, that the producer should think more on how to push this to the, to the consumer and to teach them this is not waste, this is resource. Thank you. Thank you, Marius. Well, we have run out of time. I, I had one more question, which is a, a rather provocative one, which I was going to put to, to Neil, but we'll just have to uh, take that offline, Neil, and uh, uh, see what you think. Um, thank you, everyone, for, for joining today's session. Um, just a final reminder that um, this is uh, a part of a regular series of virtual panels. Um, some of them will be appearing on the, the Packaging Europe web Packaging Europe website in the future. And to access those, you'll need to, to sign up. Um, so uh, please don't miss out and, and join us there. Um, secondly, I wanted to remind you that we have the face-to-face -face, uh, discussions of the Sustainable Packaging Summit taking place on the 13th and 14th of September in Lisbon. Um, and uh, love to see uh, some of you there. And hopefully some of our speakers will be able to make it as well. Uh, again, you can get more details on the Packaging Europe website or our LinkedIn page. Um, for now, thank you very much, everyone, for joining us. And special thanks to our four speakers, Vanessa Chesno, Marius Kostak, John Sadlia, and Neil Walker. Thanks, everyone. Goodbye. Thank you very much. Bye.